Hey guys, today's video is about the differences between doing residential construction and commercial construction in hotel motel. I've been a champion of getting the zoning for hotel and motel for a long period of time. The vast majority of our projects in the Stomp Capital portfolio are hotel motel. And the reason is because we will refuse to take regulatory risk. We will not be put out of business if somebody changes their mind or changes the legislation. We're just not playing those games. We're running a business here. We need to know we can operate legally. And the best example I can give is if you are a restaurant on tour would you run your business in your home where like it's working now but it, the law could change or would you go out and get a commercial establishment where you have a commercial kitchen you know you can operate legally successfully for like 10 years or longer that's the way to think about this opportunity the upside in the motel hotel zoning is generally speaking it's never challenged, right? So if you take a look at the newspapers, every town, city, county, whatever, is going through their own inspection about Airbnb and short-term rentals, and do we do it this way, and do we do it that way, and do we have licenses and permits, and they're changing. Like, one day it's there's no rule, then the next day it's legal and there's a rule, then the next time there's a lottery, and then there's a certain number of permits, and they're reducing the permits, then it's illegal all of a sudden. Well, when was the last time you read anything about a commercially zoned hotel and motel being questioned, being downsized, being you know removed. It's no longer legal to have hotels in Palm Springs, California, where I'm filming this. That would never happen. Yet, in short-term rentals, there's tons of restrictions. There's noise ordinances. There's number of vehicle restrictions. There's number of nights that you can rent out. There's a number of um, restrictions on the number of units that can be like rented out in the entire county. And so short-term rentals, whether rightly or wrongly, are getting a bad rap. And consequently, all of the different politicians have you know, different cards that they're playing at various times, and it's changing. So it's, it's good, it's bad, it's good, it's bad. We need it, we don't like it. The neighbors complain, we don't like it. You know? Whereas Hotel Motel, steady. Part of the reason, in addition to the superior zoning, is that we have scale, right? So we're opening up a 14-unit, one-bedroom, all-suite, 750-square-foot hotel, and so we immediately have scale. We've got 14 Airbnbs or 14 direct bookings as opposed to one single family home. So there's a lot of value in it, but there's also different codes and different local laws and regulations. And I wanna give you a couple of examples of like things that would matter tremendously and have cost implications and time implications before you get started. So the first example is when you build under commercial zone, at least in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and I believe it's probably everywhere in the United States, we have to have sprinklers and fire safety and things that you don't really need to do in residential. But that's probably not a surprise. The surprise might be the tap fees to run a water line that's big enough to handle a dedicated sprinkler system. And what I mean by that is the water that's supplied to the kitchens and the bathrooms, let's call it a residential water line. There's a separate water line which is dedicated just to fire safety and the sprinklers and it's a different size and you have to put that in. So that's very expensive, requires different set of inspectors coming and so on so that not only has cost but also delays and we're talking tens of thousands of dollars for this tap fee. I think in the Outer Banks in Pamlico Station, the number is somewhere around $75,000 just to run the water line to connect to the sprinkler system, which then costs tens of thousands of dollars to install throughout 14 different units. So again, a very big difference versus just plugging in a carbon monoxide detector and a smoke detector, isn't it? When we have the asphalt parking area, in residential, you just have it like built to residential standards and nobody really thinks about sort of what's underneath the asphalt, what's underneath the parking. In order to have a commercial zoned place in the Outer Banks of North Carolina, we need to make sure that it can withstand a 75,000 pound fire truck. So we are now doing geotechnical testing and boring to understand what is underneath the asphalt and can it withstand 75,000 pounds of weight because God forbid there's a fire or an emergency, you're going to get that you know, big fire truck coming down and they wanna make sure that it's not gonna sink, it's not gonna crater, it's not gonna create sinkholes or anything like that. So the testing is expensive, the time it takes to coordinate that extra trade is you know, time consuming. And these are kind of things that you would never really think about in residential. I've never tested what's underneath my parking area in my single family home. I've never really worried about the 75,000 pound truck. And what's kind of interesting is it's the same fire truck that would come to my house versus the hotel. But I guess because there's more people in the hotel, there's more lives and they have to act more quickly, they can't really worry about getting stuck and so on. So these are just some of the things that one might not expect if you've never done this before. 
everything has to be ADA compliant, right? So like we have to build stairs and ramps and the hot tub and the sauna and the cold plunges. I mean, this all has to be accessible and believe it or not, when you go out and buy a barrel sauna, very few of them are ADA compliant because most people will step into the sauna and that's it. Well, we have to be able to have a wheelchair go into the sauna and the size of the barrel sauna has to accommodate a wheelchair that can turn around. And so this is not only fair and, and equitable, but it's also expensive and it limits your choices and you have to be thinking about this or you won't get your certificate of occupancy if it's not ADA compliant. We have an entire room that is built for ADA compliance and that means that our kitchen has changed, our washer and dryer has changed, the access has changed, everything has changed. So we have a particular unit that is ADA accessible that you would never do in your residential home unless one of your family members was, you know, required it. So there's just a lot of different things and the benefit is we have better zoning, we have more people, we have more scale. The downside is it's going to take you longer to construct, it's gonna cost more money, you're gonna to have to have ADA, and so you just have to factor that going in. I don't want anybody to go around listening to me or others on YouTube saying, hotels, motels is where you wanna be, there's scale, there's this and that, and just think it's as easy as doing you know, a single family home. It's very rewarding, it's super fun, um, it's really a great business opportunity, one that we're fully taking advantage of, and we're creating videos with behind the scene footage of the construction and so on, and we wanna share all this with you, but we also wanna warn you, it's not what you've been doing if you're only used to doing single family homes. There are differences, there are nuances, you gotta pay attention, you have to be informed, you have to be educated, and you have to build a different team, different engineers, different consultants, different counsel, but in the end, if you do it, you gotta do it right, and you will be rewarded. Some other things to consider if you're going into the hotel, motel sort of space, is that there's also different OTAs for your booking engine, right? So you need to be on Expedia or booking.com. You can do that too if you're a short-term rental. You can put it on Airbnb and on Verbo and also on Expedia or booking.com, but they're not very successful and most people don't get very many bookings. And in fact, if and when you do get a booking, often the guest is kind of confused. They thought they were booking a hotel. Turns out that they're at a single family home and they're asking you like where, you know, do you have dry cleaning? Do you have room service? And the answer is no, we're a single family home. We're an Airbnb. But when you're on Expedia or booking.com and you're a hotel, you may get a lot of different bookings. So in addition to being on Airbnb, where you may get fewer bookings, these other OTAs are more significant. So there's a lot of different variables. I would suggest that you get started slowly rather than like dive right in, but the opportunities are massive if you do it well. And so we're super excited. Hotel motel zoning is superior in terms of less regulatory risk, easier to scale. You have more units and you have more keys and you have more business opportunities. The downside is that it can be more expensive and there's more regulatory hurdles that you have to comply with, right? Like all that sprinkler information that I mentioned to you earlier, it's the right thing to do so nobody feels bad about it, but like you, you gotta do it, right? Or your business license could be taken away. So my question for you all is, who's transitioning from short-term rentals into motel hotel? What questions do you have? We will read the comments and answer them and also make videos to help others. So how can we help you more in this transition? And is this interesting? Comment below.